All right, very, very quickly, in 10 or maybe 15 minutes, we may go into our break, but that's no problem. Let's say a little bit about another uh, side of life in um, the countryside in the Middle Ages, um, but relating to the upper uh, echelons, the upper parts of the society. And this is the developing institution of knighthood, or in the broader sense, chivalry. Okay, and you've all seen these great Hollywood movies with uh, chivalrous knights running around doing this and that and so on, which obviously um, relates to a certain ideal, but not necessarily uh, to the reality. But um, we'll have a few thoughts about this now, and, uh, uh, and we'll perhaps today or next week have a look at Chaucer's Knight and what uh, gets, has to be said there. In Old English, they had the word knicht, uh, which is where the modern word knight uh, comes from. In Latin, the word for a fighter, a warrior of one sort or another, going back to Roman times, miles, okay, which obviously is where words like military and militia uh, come from. Um, in French, they had the word chevalier. Uh, which sounds far more romantic than either the uh, Latin or the English word. Here is a definition of a medieval knight given by um, Maurice Keane, who uh, was a very great uh, medievalist from Oxford. A medieval knight, he says, in his book on chivalry, was, quote, a man of aristocratic standing or probable noble ancestry who is capable, if called upon, to, of equipping himself with a war horse and the arms, that means weapons, not physically his arms, uh, of a heavy cavalryman, and who had been through certain rituals, ceremonies, that made him what he is, who has been, quote, dubbed to knighthood. Okay. And that nice little definition there, in my mind, encapsulates most of the things uh, which we need to understand when discussing the concept of knight and knighthood in the Middle Ages. And the concept itself was not static. Like anything in the Middle Ages, it was always changing and developing. We have to be careful about that. But for a start, we obviously have the concept uh, the knight is some kind of warrior, okay? Someone who does fighting, that's the main thing. But what in particular, what special kind of warrior was the knight. What do we get from, from here? He's not just anyone who fights. He has a certain style and way of fighting which distinguishes him from other fighters. we come to all that later. Uh, well, they, well I, yeah, they all need some kind of weapons, otherwise they'll be pretty useless as fighters. That's, but uh, uh, yeah, particularly horses, okay? And the French word chevalier uh, specifically relates to that idea of, of being uh, a cavalryman, as it's said in the quotation, okay? So it's a mounted uh, warrior, okay? And a horse is a relatively expensive item, okay? So to have a horse, or more than one horse, and to fight on a horse, which obviously gives you physically advantage over someone on the ground, uh, indicates socio and economic uh, higher status, relatively. Uh, Keane also mentioned uh, nobility, aristocracy, and so on, okay? Some kind of legal definition that makes you uh, somehow different from everyone else. Though technically and originally, Okay, not everyone who was a nobleman in the central Middle Ages was a knight. Uh, okay, it was a special status as well because you went through certain processes, certain um, experiences, certain challenges, and then a ceremony, and you were dubbed into the night, okay? So you achieve that status, whatever you may have been before, okay? You pass a number of tests in a sense and then you are, and then you are invested with that position or whatever. So uh, you have a, a family kind of background, but it's connected to undergoing special uh, things as well. 
So uh, these are the various elements that we have to mix together. Now, later in the Middle Ages, the warrior element begins to become less important and the noble status is more important. So then to be sir this or sir that okay, uh, is the key. So there's a shift kind of more in that kind of direction. So the knight, to be a knight uh, of the shire or whatever was more a social status thing rather than a, a technical status or uh, a status which you achieved uh, because of some uh, merit and achievement and things like that. So there is a, a shift away in the later Middle Ages as well which is very important. As Fatih mentioned, connected to knighthood or particularly to the idea of chivalry uh, was uh, a certain belief in behaviour as well. Okay. Chivalry um, is part of this thing as well. Anyone want to tell us a bit about that? The ideal that is, of course. What is chivalry, chevalier? What is that? What did it involve? What kind of behaviour uh, are we talking about here? Fair play, fighting with the <coughs> Yes. Uh, it's, yeah, okay, there's a moral element, that's very, very important. Um, Being brave. Okay, there is the sense of bravery as well, okay, personal uh, valour or something like that. Uh, the moral side mixed for in. The good of people. Fighting for the good of people. Right, okay, yeah, often fighting for the good of ladies is the image that we get and so on and things or like religion. that. Sorry? Or yeah, we'll come to that one in a minute, that's very important. Edgem? Okay, loyalty, yes, okay, that's uh, a key as well. We can find many, many documents written in Latin but also vernacular languages which describe kind of these ideals or whatever. And the last one which Fatty uh, added in is the religious side. Some people have suggested that these moral elements especially is again part of this attempt by the church to kind of control violence and then to present a certain number of, of kind of Christian morals that these, these knights should do. We've been talking about this with reference to the crusade that somehow you know, fighting properly is what you should be doing. So as well as saying go and fight the Muslims in, uh, in the Near East, in the Holy Land or something, another way of dealing with that is to say, okay, fighters, here are the kind of rules that you should follow, which is things like valor and, and fair play and all these things. And we're most familiar with these things, or we're most familiar with them from the movies. People in the Middle Ages will be familiar with them from stories that were told, many of which survive in written form today. The stories of King Arthur, for example, are part of that tradition. Uh, and particularly in French, we have a lot of literature which relates to uh, uh, what's called the chanson des gestes, the, 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 the deeds and behaviours of, of famous particular fictional and sometimes not so fictional knights and things like that. Of course, this is all the ideal, and just as in Hollywood we don't believe what we see in the movies, so medieval people probably didn't actually believe what they heard or what they read if they were literate uh, in these stories. Okay? They would have realised that this is uh, the presentation of an ideal, and the re reality was these guys were probably rather bloodthirsty fighters who had a rather more pragmatic uh, view of things rather than necessarily following these perfect codes and so on, and that's a, a kind of artificial cover which is added on top uh, to, uh, to present uh, their ideas. Last point before we finish. Um, as, uh, as knighthood developed into the 13th and later centuries especially, okay, as I said, we get these, uh, the, the development of the noble status uh, connected to families becomes more important, as I said. And physically, okay, the uh, armour that these men were wearing became more complicated and became uh, very, very heavy. Okay? And again, you, you're familiar from uh, the Hollywood side of these guys walking around. You can hardly see their faces are all covered up and things. They have to be lifted somehow onto the top of their horse, which is also uh, uh, often um, you know, heavily dressed and things like that. Uh, and you imagine a medieval battle then, just bunches of these kind of robot guys walking around at a certain point, coming in or on their horse, uh, uh, if they're the knights uh, particularly. And then you're thinking, hang on. Um, is that my friend or is that the other? You can't tell. You can't even see the guy's face or whatever. Uh, and so this is very important um, because of um, it leads to the development of something else which uh, we should mention here, um, which is called heraldry. Okay, into the later Middle Ages and, and, and uh, into the modern period, uh, you get connected usually to 
uh, families, you get the development of images, pictures, which are kind of symbols of that particular knightly family. Okay, so here is from the 17th century, post-medieval, of course. Uh, obviously, I, I am descended from great knightly stock. Now, I suspect my, my ancestors were peasants in one of those manners, in fact, uh, more than likely. But uh, you would probably go around, particularly on your shield, okay, with a simplified, fairly clear version of, of, your, uh, of your insignia. And then, of course, your friend would say, oh, hang on, that's Thornton, I won't kill him, I'll kill this guy over here, or whatever, and so on. But then again, once again, the pragmatic, practical origin of that uh, gets developed into a whole thing. You get, you get whole uh, people whose career, basically, is, is building up genealogies and heraldry uh, for particular families and regions and things like that. It becomes very much part of the sort of social side rather than the uh, practical side of society. Uh, I just have a terminology question. Wasn't that crest yes. instead of heraldry? Or uh, uh, these are same? Same kind of thing. This, well, yeah, crest, or, or we would often say coat of arms is the other word uh, for this, okay, because it's the, it's the uh, armour, again, it's the image on the, on the heraldry is the term for collecting and studying and the development of this. So it's the term for covering the whole of this kind of field. And you will get people called heralds who were the ones who looked after these things and controlled them and recorded them and wrote them up in books and, and so on, and things like that later on uh, to some extent. So people with the surname might have been involved with this kind of stuff. No. Yeah, is there a surname Herald? Have you come across it? Mr. Herald, possibly. Oh, yeah. first name. Well, well, yeah, that's just a, one of these things where you get the surname mixed. I'm, I'm sure it's not impossible that there might be someone called John Herald somewhere. Yeah, I, I haven't come across one myself. Weren't Heralds also like messengers? Herald uh, is only there also a messenger kind of person who. Well, it's a different meaning of the word. Here, in the technical sense, yeah, yeah, we mean the put. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can use it that way. Yeah, yeah. Person who brings a message to the court. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. In that sense. Okay. But here, different, different. Yeah, as far as I know, different. Yeah, yeah. The same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions before we have a break? Maria's going. I'm, I thought we would. Maria, I thought we were talking at the end of the next class. Ha, ha, all right, so we'll see, yeah, all right, okay, okay. All right, I shall sheath my sword, don my armor, and let you all have a break, and then we shall get on to Chaucer. Okay, do you have your copies of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in front of you? You have the text with you? Uh, I put the one online for you to look at. Though I shall be using um, my own photocopy from my own book, uh, so it's perfectly possible that um, uh, we may have slightly different versions of the text. Uh, I don't know whether they're both based <laughs> upon the same. I think one of the most famous ones is the Hengut uh, manuscript, but I don't know that. So we may, we may, interestingly enough, uh, encounter a few a few differences here or there. Here is a. Uh, contemporary, I think, painting of, uh, of the man himself, uh, considered to be the kind of, by many people, uh, the sort of uh, uh, founding father of, uh, of uh, English literature to some extent, though obviously there were uh, very good authors before him, but he's the, the, the earliest, most famous and well-known uh, writer. Um, he lived during the 14th century, which is what we're going to be looking at uh, next week. Uh, I'm not sure about the latest state of research, but some point after about 1330, perhaps by about 1340 was when he's born. I don't know if we know anything more specific now, but we know he did die in 1400. Uh, and he had an interesting kind of up and down career, uh, which involved uh, being involved with kings, members of the royal family, and having some involvement in the Hundred Years' War, again, which we shall be talking about uh, next week. Um, some people in the class have studied Chaucer before as English literature students, um, but that's Elif and Maria. <laughs> and neither of them are here. We are unable to benefit from their, uh, 
uh, thoughts and experience this week, but we shall carry on and read a bit more next week if we have time. So maybe we can uh, 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 look out for their comments there. Now, um, the text we're looking at, as you know, generally known as, with a slightly darker pen, uh, the Canterbury uh, Tales, because it, uh, as I mentioned briefly at the end of our last class, it involves a collection of stories told by different people who are together on a pilgrimage from London to Canterbury. Um, and uh, it's suggested, I think, by the host uh, that uh, you know, rather than just sitting along and idly chatting to each other and, and complaining about the weather and things, uh, that why don't they make the journey uh, a little bit more interesting by by each telling a story and the winner will get some kind of a prize and he will be the, uh, the judge of that. Uh, now obviously this is a, a fictional idea that Chaucer has used as a way of collecting together, as a frame for collecting together uh, uh, different stories from very, very different sources, classical as well as contemporary uh, and so on that he puts together and he writes some of them in kind of verse and others in simple prose and so on. We're looking at the prologue, which is the introduction, where he tells a little bit about why they're there, and then he says a little bit about the various people who are gathered and are ready to set off on this uh, journey with him. He's one of the participants. He is the eye uh, in that part of the story. Um, so it's quite nice, because although it's fiction, it's made up, okay, in that sense, um, it gives us a snapshot of medieval society, 14th century English society, uh, or at least someone's representation of that society. And the people on the, cruc on the crusade, on the pilgrimage, uh, are of a great variety from different levels of society, from different parts of the uh, uh, social scale, uh, but also uh, different experiences, different parts of uh, uh, experiences. So you have clergymen, you have secular people, you have men, you have women, uh, you have people living in towns, you have people coming from villages and things like that. So uh, it's precisely the kind of thing which is nice for us. Now we're not saying that we can read the prologue and it will tell us accurately what medieval society was like in the uh, second half of the 14th century. It's his representation. Often he is using these little descriptions as a kind of criticism or comment upon people. So we have to read it with a certain uh, satirical eye and try and work out what's he saying and read between the lines, as we say in English, to, to understand exactly what the purpose here is. Um, so it gives, tells us as much about kind of Chaucer or popular ways of looking at people in the society as well as uh, the, um, uh, the society itself. We could have read the text in um, translation and if you wanted to look at a translated version uh, on the internet or uh, in the library then I would have had no problem with that. But um, late Middle English, 14th century English, is a little bit strange, but with a bit of thought you can more or less see how it connects to uh, uh, the English that we speak today. It's not like if I gave you Beowulf or even the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle to read, uh, we'd find one or two words which we might kind of recognise, but otherwise the, the words, the spelling, uh, the grammar would be completely different. By Chaucer's time, English is kind of pretty much on its way to becoming what it is uh, today. Uh, but there are certain uh, aspects of the grammar and to some extent the orthography that we need to uh, comment on. So I put this little guide up, and it's not really a comprehensive guide to late Middle English by any means, but a couple of points that perhaps we should stress. Um, where does the word they, them, there come from. If we were looking at, middle, uh, at very early Middle English or at uh, Old English, we would not see those words there. We would have different words to describe they, those people. Okay. Now we have the word they absolutely in all forms of English. 
uh, maybe some Creoles may have a different word, I don't know, but uh, that pronoun, uh, third person plural, mm -hmm. do we know where it comes from? Is it no, slightly closer to home linguistically. The Vikings, okay. Uh, the, the, the sound there um, is, a, is a clue to that. Uh, Old English, Middle English, the words for they and them and so on, uh, to a large extent, had an H sound at the start. And there was a danger of confusing words for, because they didn't spell things consistently either, words for he or her sounded very similar. So in the north of England, they had actually started using the Viking words, because there were lots of Vikings, lots of Viking influence linguistically there. And slowly during the Middle Ages, that pattern tends to spread down until you get to the early modern period where pretty much the they has taken over and replaced the real English pronouns. So uh, every day, even all of you, when you practice or read English, you're actually using a few Viking words there that you're not necessarily aware of. Okay? Uh, so third person plural uh, nominative they Okay, he has, perfectly okay, but he hasn't quite adopted the other forms. So, for example, we will get here, maybe some different spellings, which means their, their car or not their car, whatever. But similar things can also mean her, so we, there can be some confusion there. And the dative, the oblique form, hem, okay, means to them, okay, and not him, which is how we might assume it might be. So. Uh, Chaucer, he's in a kind of transition phase as these northern forms are slowly taking over. So that's one little thing that we need to be aware of. The inflection of the verbs, uh, almost the simplified forms we have today, but again, and again, Scandinavian northern English tradition is very important in simplifying the English verbal system, but a few things here we should mention. Okay, second person uh, singular, uh, okay, uh, usually ending in EST. It's the origin of the ES forms, just drop the T that we have today. And uh, um, uh, Middle English and Early Modern English uh, retained the traditional form thou, for thou, for one person. You originally meant all of you, okay, plural. But English has lost the singular form and we use the word all of you to mean just you as well, okay? We don't have the sen, sis, the two vu form of French. And the two in French, or if you know your Persian, whatever, the same thing, obviously, ultimately the same Indo-European word, but we've lost that. So, sorry? Can we do that? How do we do that? Ah, we suppose we can increase the, um, is that a bit better? All uh, right, okay, we're going to lose a few, uh, that didn't help at all, but, uh, so, uh, okay, second person, thou, you on your own, okay, thou lovest, okay, you love in modern English. Uh, the third person, uh, he has the southern English forms, okay, uh, of the he, she, it, uh, with a th at the end, so he beginneth means he begins, okay? Or we'll get this word coming up quite a lot. Hath, where we, if we change that to the S, and we get the word has. He hath done something, whatever, okay? Slowly, inflection in the plural is being simplified, okay? But you do get cases where we'll get en as the, or n uh, as the ending uh, indicating a plural uh, or a verb form. Similarly, the original, uh, in Middle English, the original uh, infinitive, to do something, uh, would have ended in an N, okay? Uh, we've dropped that now, so to ridden is our to ride. And uh, if you know your German or whatever, uh, some participles, but Chaucer, I think, is losing that as well. Sometimes are this little prefix, uh, i, here. He was late, i come, okay, which is uh, uh, the ge, or whatever, goes back to in, uh, Old English, the ge form, which they're losing as well. So it's just a, uh, a form of the participle there. So I think those are the main little linguistic -y things that we need to be uh, aware of. Uh, we may come across a few more as we go through. If I go back here, I suppose we can even, um, oh, 
Uh, oh, here it is. This is what you've got, isn't it? Okay, I've got my form here. Okay, let me have a go at reading, uh, no doubt very badly, uh, anyone watching this on the internet who is a Middle English expert will say, oh, that was terrible pronunciation or something like that. But then we don't really know exactly. I read a science fiction novel a few years ago, 10 years ago or more now, where uh, they've kind of discovered time travel. And it's in Oxford. It's uh, written by an American, I think, but there are all these professors in Oxford. And they've got this chance to send a graduate student back in time to the 14th century, whatever. And they've, for some reason, she's an expert at... Uh, speaking Chaucer's English, but of course this is kind of formal written English, so she ends up in the Middle Ages and no one's got a clue what she's saying and they haven't got a clue what she's saying. So we're not even assuming that this is exactly what uh, your average Londoner or whatever may have been saying, but let's not worry too much about that. Okay. Well, um, well my version here, which we don't have there on the on online one, begins with, Here beginneth the book of the tales of Canterbury. One that April in his showerous suit, the draught of March has pierced to the root and bathed every vein in sweet liquor of which virtue engendered is the floor. When Zephyrus eke with his sweet a breath, inspired hath in every halt and heath, the tender croppes and the younger son hath in the ram his half course iron, and smaller fowlers make in melody that sleep an owl the nicht with open e. So pricketh hem nature in her courageas, than longen folk to goon on pilgrimage is. And palmares for to see constrange astrons, to ferna halways, couth in sundry lawns, and specially from every shire end, of Ingeland to Canterbury they wend, the holy blissful martyr for to seek, that hem hath holpen when they were seek. All right, I may have missed the odd word out, but that's uh, uh, more or less what I've got here and pretty much what you've got up there. Um, we could actually more or less read that and just transfer every word there and pronounce it as a modern English word. When that April in his showers uh, suit, sweet maybe, the drought of March has pierced to the root and, baned, uh, and bathed every vein in such liquor of which virtue engendered is the flower, and so on. So you can actually more or less just pronounce them as a modern word. Uh, the, the syntax, the order may be a bit odd and here or there, but then poetry is always like that. Uh, so it's not too difficult in that sense, uh, just if you know what you're looking for and so on. Um, I should add, of course, in terms of spelling, the problem was that uh, after the Norman Conquest, especially when English as a literary language declined because French took over, because that was the language of the Normans and so on, uh, and so the status of English uh, in higher circles disappeared, only to reemerge after a hundred or so years in, in a serious way. Uh, even at that point, uh, for most vernacular, not Latin languages, there was no kind of standard. So they didn't say, this is the correct way to spell. Okay? That's, to some extent, a more of a modern hang-up anyway. Even uh, if they were more or less consistent, they wouldn't have had a big problem with a few changes of spelling here or there. Uh, so um, even people copying this, scribes would have maybe changed the spelling just because they spell it in their way, and, and no one would have had a problem, and so on. So some words seem a little bit odd uh, here or there, but uh, uh, more or less, we can see the connection to modern words. All right, um, anyone want to tell us what that paragraph, quite a long sentence really, it's a, I was waiting for the full stop to come, getting a bit desperate. Uh, when that April with his showers sweet, the drought of March has pierced to the root and bathed every vein in such liquor of which virtue engendered is the flower. What are we talking about here? In one word. Spring. Spring, okay. Um, April, Showers, we say, it rains uh, uh, more in England than it does in, uh, in Anatolia, but uh, it tends to rain a lot during that time, okay? And the dryness of March has, has, been, has been washed, has been whatever, bathed and so on. And obviously uh, the liquor, the, it's giving life to, uh, to the flowers especially and so on. So spring is there coming, okay? And Zephyrus, Zephyrus? North wind. North wind, okay, so the wind. Uh, eek is one of my favourite 
Old English. I think we should revive the word eek. Also, it means. I think there should be a, uh, a general thing to revise the word eek, because I think it's a great word. I should add that into my own vocabulary. Maybe my children will start using it, and it'll spread or something. But, and uh, also when Zephyr is blah, 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 and so on. Okay. And again, the reference to the tender crops, and the sun has gone round the half course round the ram. That's all the stuff in the sky, and so on. Okay. Smaller fowless. Foul, fowless. Birds here, okay, in general, I think it refers to it. So um, we still have the word foul, but it's not very commonly used anymore. Okay, make and melody singing. Okay, um, <coughs> is that the nightingale particularly, perhaps? So pricketh hem nature in her courages. Cu courages, sorry. Um, this is a nice sentence. What's the subject of this sentence? Who's doing something in this line here? Nature. So nature pricketh, nature kind of pushes, hem is them, okay, in, in to be brave or something like that. Okay, then long and folk to goon on pilgrimage. So people long. You might know that. We sometimes say in English, oh, I long for this. It means I really want, I have this desire or something like that. To go on pilgrimages and pal palmas, okay, to seek strange strands, to find distant shores and so on. Uh, Ferna halwes. Ferno is a word meaning old. We don't really have that anymore. Halwes is like hallow, Halloween, holy things. Okay. Uh, and Kuth and well known uh, in sundry lands, many different lands. And this is where we're going to bring Alpin. And especially from every Shira's end, from all parts of the country uh, of England, to Canterbury they wend. Now, you all know one of the annoying things about English. Uh, is one of the most fundamental verbs that we have. Complete in the present tense, we go. In the past tense, we went. And you're thinking, OK, how can you get from that to that? Well, in fact, they're, they're two unrelated verbs that have been kind of combined together. And again, very occasionally archaic, formal spoken English, we can use the word wend. Okay, I wend my weary way to the classroom, or something like that. And Chaucer uses it here. Okay, uh, from every shire's end of England to Canterbury, they wend, they go. Okay, the holy blissful martyr for to seek, uh, that hem hath holpen when that they were seek. The blissful martyr, the saint. Okay, but a, a martyred saint, for to seek, for to find. This is again slightly archaic phrase. For to means in order to, okay. Um, who, that, who, uh, them, hem, has helped when that they were sick. The martyr who has helped them when they were ill, okay. Huh. Ill and sick. One of them is English, one of them is Viking. Have a go at guessing. Which one's the Viking one of those words? Ill. Iller, something like that. Okay. Um, and it's, it's the, people on the internet may disagree, but uh, as far as I know, um, North America, if you're not very well, you can be sick. Okay. Now, when I was a child growing up in uh, Britain, at least, if you were sick, it usually meant you're kind of vomiting. Oh, I'm going to be sick, you say, or whatever. Um, now, this is spreading a little bit more. Uh, if well, not very well, I would say I was ill, primarily. But if I'm particularly got a stomach upset, then I'd say I'm sick and leave and I'd run out the room or whatever and things like that. But these days, partly because of Hollywood and so on, everyone is sick all the time, ill perhaps is. The Viking word is losing out and so on. OK, so Alp, yes. why are they all going to Canterbury? Who is this blissful martyr for to seek? Archbishop of Canterbury died and he made Thomas the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
after Thomas became Beckett became the Archbishop of Canterbury, they no longer kind of agreed on matters. And then the tension between the church, as it were, represented by Thomas and the King of England, Henry II, became quite problematic. And there are reasons for this, but maybe I shouldn't go into We won't go into all the finer details of church-state relations in the uh, 12th century. And at some point, things became <coughs> so, so serious that um, Beckett had to run away because he feared for his life. And at some point, there was a reconciliation, and Beckett uh, was to come back. And he did come back, but again, problems pursued. And at some point, it is said Henry II, uh, who was also said to be quite an angry person, uh, just shouted out, Who is going to rid me or save me from. Might be rid, yes. Rid. Mm. Who is going to rid me of this um, church man? Something. And apparently his entourage, a couple of knights in his entourage, interpreted this as an order to go and kill Thomas. And they got on their horses and went to Canterbury, and they uh, murdered Beckett in the church. Uh, and then he became a martyr soon enough, he was sanctified, and then after his death this myth and legacy emerged and a shrine was established in Canterbury and people started going there uh, as pilgrims. Some of them believed that he had uh, healing powers, and, but essentially this myth was produced and the Canterbury Tales simply refers to this. Yeah, yeah, it's, this is a group of people who are, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it was, it became the most important pilgrimage site uh, in the whole of, uh, of England, so it was, uh, if you couldn't afford to travel to the Holy Land or, or somewhere else in Europe, then obviously Canterbury was the, was the best place to, to visit, to get via one of the saints, in this case uh, Becket, to get some kind of um, uh, help from God, yes. This, that's, um, this, this march of the saint helped them when they were sick is actually one of, one of the things about uh, St. Thomas Becket. I mean, it's not, I guess, it might be a general thing, but he's associated with uh, helping the Yeah, some saints have specialities, and yeah, and that, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Al. So that puts it into a context for us, uh, and we've read that bit of Chaucer. Let's jump down now to, on yours, it's line 43, uh, and oh, we've only, only got 15 minutes. So time flies by when you're enjoying yourself, doesn't it? I don't know why, uh, uh, and don't say uh, anything against that. Um, Let's have a, okay, since I was talking about the uh, uh, chivalry a little bit, we were discussing that before, let's have a look at uh, his description of the knight uh, here, which uh, um, is quite interesting, because I think there's all sorts of double entendres, there's double meanings and all sorts of stuff in this portrayal. What it tells us about knights and the ideal and the reality is, uh, is quite interesting. Do we have a volunteer? Anyone want to have a go at reading a bit of... Chaucer's Middle English here. Anyone brave, feeling brave? <laughs> no? Maybe next time then. We'll, we'll get Maria or uh, Elif because they've done it before then. Are you trying with translating it or pronunciating? Just read what you've got in front of you. Yeah, yeah. That might be a. No, thank you. All right, okay. I'll get the translation in a minute. Okay. A knicht there was, and that a worthy man, that for the timer that he first began to read and out, he loved chivalry, truth and honour, freedom and courtesy. Full worthy he was he in his lordes ware, and thereto had he ridden no man fair, as well in Christendom as in heathenness, and even honoured for his worthiness. At Alessandra he was, when it was won, full oft time he had the board begun, Above and all nations in Prusse. In Leto had he raised and in Rus, no Christian man so oft of his degree. In Gernada at the siege eke had he be of Algezir and ridden in Belmarie. At Lais was he and at Satali when they were one and in the great sea. At many a noble army had he be. 
A mortal battle, at mortal battles had he been fifteen, and foughten for our faith at Tramesine. In Listus Thrace, and I slain his foe. His Ilko, this Ilka worthy knight, Nicht, had been also some time uh, with the Lord of Palate, again another heathen in Turkey. And evermore he had a sovereign priest, and though he was worthy, he was wise. And of his port, as meek as is a maid, he never yet no villainy nessayed. Uh, in all his leaf, unto no manner wicked. He was a very perfect, gentle nicht. And for to tell in you of his array, his horse wearing good, and he ne was not gay. Of Fustian he weared a gipon, all besmotted with his habergone, for he was late he come from his viage, and went for to do his pilgrimage. We'll stop at that point there. That all clear? Yes? Got that one? All right, so. What do we get about this knight then? Start at the beginning, have a little read through this. A knight there was, and that a worthy man. From the time that he first began to ride out, he loved chivalry, truth and honour, freedom and <coughs> courtesy. We didn't mention courtesy before. These days just means kind of good behaviour, polite behaviour. But of course, courtesy technically means the behaviour of the court, which is the Lord's court, the King's court, where the knights were supposed to go. So it's part of the whole chivalry thing, in a sense. Um, so what, what's Chaucer saying at the start? He's presenting the knight in what way? Very stereotypically chivalrous. Very stereotypically chivalrous. Yes, he's a chivalrous knight. Okay, truth and honour, blah blah blah. Okay, he's fitting in with the ideal, with the the stereotype that they had. Okay, and in addition to the chivalry side, what else does he then indicate in the next bit? Full worthy was he in his lord's wear. Uh, war. Okay. Uh, and there too had he ridden, no man, no one had ridden further than him, okay, uh, blah, blah, blah. Then uh, we get all this list of the places he's been fighting in and so on, okay. Yeah, he's, he's done a lot of fighting. He's, uh, he's a tough guy in that sense, okay. Uh, he's, been, he's been active in Christ, Christian, Christendom as well as in heathenness in Muslim lands and things like that, okay, and he was, he was worthy in that sense. Um, Sorry? He wasn't gay. Yeah, well, we'll come back to that in a minute, okay. Um, and he'd been, and at mortal battles, you know, very dangerous fights, he'd been, had been at fight 15 very uh, uh, famous battles, okay. And I, and also, he'd always, always slain his foe. He'd always uh, killed the guys and so on. And we won't go into all the identification of all these places, but you've got places in Islamic world as well as in the Christian Euro European world here and so on. Sorry? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll come to that in a minute. Okay, that's, uh, um, uh, that's uh, uh, an interesting point. Um, and evermore he had a sovereign priest, for though that he were worthy, he was wise. Now, have we got that here? We've missed that one. Now, let's go down to that. Now, this is the bit where I think things shift a little bit, these lines here. Interpretations of those two lines. He had a sovereign price, for though he was worthy, he was wise. He wasn't stupid. He was a mercenary. Uh, that seems to be, it could be, I don't know what the, the latest Chaucerian literature is on this subject, but the implication is that he received money for his fighting. He was a, a mercenary, obviously, as we said. Uh, we have the ideals of, of Christian fight, knights and so on going out. Uh, and fighting for their for the lady or for God or something, but uh, he was no fool. You know, fighting's all very well and good, particularly if you're a good one. But if there's money to be made, then you may as well make the money. Okay, so he uh, he was also uh, he was also receiving payment for his for his services in that sense. Um, so that was uh, uh, an important point there that we have to, I think, take on board. And this is what Charles often does. He follows some kind of stereotype, positive or even negative, 
uh, of, of the figures. And quite often he seems to have a little twist, I always find, uh, where something so subtly gets introduced which gives us a slightly, ah, hang on, slightly different picture. Ah, OK, I see, slightly a, a, a different view on that. And I think this might be what's going on here. All right? Uh, here in the, in the translation that I also checked uh, on the, the internet site on the same page, actually, on this line it says, and always won his sovereign fame for prize. So apparently, uh, the translator chose to add the word fame into this line, which doesn't exist on the, uh, on the original. Is that right? And evermore, he had a sovereign price, it says. Yeah, uh, that's how I would read that. Okay. So, so the translator chose to put fame in there, which changes then the meaning. Changes it a bit, yes. We'd need to. It's not for money. But it's the fame that he's... Right. Isn't that the case? Yes. Right, well, okay. No, it, no fame is sort of implicated here, is there? That, um, not as far as... That's my, my personal reading over the past 30 years or when I first studied Chaucer, I've always read it in that kind of a way. I mean, it could be different versions or it could be that uh, scholars interpret it to mean something different, either what I'm, uh, myself and Ravel are, are so cynically so suggesting or whatever, I don't know. We can choose to add that maybe. Yes. To make the knight uh, look in a, under different lights. Uh, yes. So he won't be fighting for money, <laughs> but for, for rather for, for, fame. for <laughs> Yeah, yes, okay. Uh, fair enough. Um, and yes, Serkan was picking up on the gay bit there, or whatever. Um, <laughs> and for to tell you of his array, his horse wearing good, um, um, but uh, he now was not gay. Uh, now, for me, the most interesting thing in that sentence isn't, is, is not the word gay, but we'll come back to that in a minute, but it's the double negative. Because you're always told that in English, double negatives turn into a positive. Okay? We've, got the, we've got the ne and the nut, which both have negative force. And in modern English, you couldn't have no and not. You'd end up saying, oh, well, that means he was rather than he wasn't. And things. Chaucer isn't doing a sort of clever play on words or anything here. He's definitely saying not. Um, but in, uh, in, in the past and in many other languages as well, double negatives is just a way of reinforcing uh, the negativity. But it's something which in English in particular we've become very kind of strict about. Um, gay here obviously has nothing to do with sexual orientation as far as I, I know in the Middle Ages. Um, but it's, it relates to, uh, uh, well, uh, happiness sometimes, but kind of... Uh, uh, here, I, it's suggesting he wasn't over showful in his things and looking brightly coloured and, and expensive and things like that or whatever. Okay, and his his clothes were meant to be a little bit simple and things like that. Um, okay, so that's the night. Uh, is there a little short one here? We've only got five minutes or so. I don't know what to look at, or should we save? Um, uh, it's a squire. I never really liked the squire very much. What have we got? Something else. Uh, we want to save the merchant and so on up for next time because we're uh, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to look. Okay, but let's very quickly read the prioress, which is quite a way down. This is the prioress. Where is she? There we are. 118, if you've got that. There was also a nun, nun we say in English, a prioress, that off here, now there is her rather than there, here smiling was full, simple and coy. Here greatest oath was but by Saint Loy. And she was clepid called, another one of these words that we shouldn't have lost, uh, Madame uh, Eglantine. And full will she sung the service divine, uh, entuned in her nose full seemly. And French she spak full fair and fetishly, uh, after the school of Stratford at Bow, for French of Paris uh, was to hear or unknow. At meat, well, it taught, uh, she was withal, uh, she lit no morsel from her lippies fall. Ne wet her fingers in her sauce uh, dip. Uh, well, could she carry a morsel and well keep? I don't know why he talks about her eating habits in such detail. Uh, that no drop ne fell upon her breast. In courtesy uh, was full, uh, was set full muchel her lest, her pleasure. Her uh, over lip uh, wiped she so clean that her cop there was no farthing seen. Of grace, 
When she drunken had her drocht, uh, full seemly after her meat she rocht. And uh, sickly she was of great deport, uh, and full pleasant and amiable of port, and painted hair to counterfeit cheer of court, and being a statlich, uh, of manner, blah, 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 we carry on, carry on, carry on. Well, uh, it does carry, carries on quite a long time. Um, so, bless you. Uh, so, we haven't got time to read it all and analyse it all. But, oh, Maria, you're back. You're our Chaucer person. Uh, you remember anything about the nun? Uh, what, do we, what do we learn about what's the nun? How does he present the nun? Do you remember anything? The nun? Nothing about? Well, yeah, but when I adopt the words, the content, what, what's he doing with, when he presents the prioress, the nun here, what kind of things does he say about her and so on? Um, religious people, members of the clergy, members of religious orders, nuns were members of uh, female groups and so on, obviously supposed to lead a simple kind of a life. Uh, now, she was a prioress, so she was quite high up. She was the head of her house or whatever, I suppose. But on the other hand, he presents her. She's a little bit vain. She's concerned with her appearance. She, you know, all this stuff about the eating and so on. And are the other things that, that, that goes on to later on. So again, he presents it in a positive way, but there's an implied criticism. She's not really doing quite what uh, a member of the church uh, should be doing, which is being kind of a little bit more simple in their manners and less concerned with themselves and so on. Okay, we'll stop there. Time is up. Uh, please read some more of this. I might ask for some more interactive reading on Tuesday. Uh, we'll think about urban society, so we'll look at uh, manufacturing, we were talking about that earlier on, uh, and aspects of t the lives in towns, maybe say a bit about universities. Alp, you've worked on universities, so you might have a few words to say for me on that. And then we might read, well, let's, we, we shall definitely read um, uh, maybe The Merchant or one of those guys, and uh, of course, The Clerk of Oxford, uh, the young student uh, uh, in Oxford. Let's read a little bit about him as well, if you can find that. Okay, thank you much again. Thank you, Eileen, for your presentation. Uh, see you all for two hours on Tuesday.